Singaporeans actually need to be equipped with the right tools and support for, able, for families to be able to pursue our dreams. All of us here today are young parents, and I think uh, between us, we have seven children <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> aged between um, nine months and eight years old. So we really are living right in the middle of uh, you know, uh, being parents and parenting and all the worries and the joys and the frustrations and all the screaming that comes along with it. <laughs> and I think you know, everyone probably can tell by our eye bags uh, <laughs> and the white hairs on our heads, you know, just, just how, um, how much of a joy our children are. <laughs> um, anyway, so uh, coming back to the topic of families, um, I think you know, uh, it's quite obvious that the family trends in Singapore are changing. We're seeing more later marriages, you know, marriages, uh, uh, divorces, remarriages. So I think, you know, we really have to have a really good heart think about how our policies, which were probably shaped during a time where, you know, things were a bit more stable or, uh, you know, there was a more traditional family structure. Um, then these policies might have made sense then, but I think now they're probably a, a source of strain for some of the families that we're seeing. Um, so I think for me, I, the most important thing is uh, cost-benefit analysis should not really take precedence anymore. Um, you know, we really need to get to the heart of the matter, and by heart I really mean you know the, the, some of the softer uh, areas around uh, our families. And um, yeah, so I think uh, this really has a make us think very hard about what 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 we have to. Uh, to, to legislate and the policies that we actually come into force as an economy and as a society. So first off, uh, we're going to have a speech from Dennis Tan and he will be talking to us about the cost of living. Dear Singaporeans, in the course of helping low-income families and residents in Aogang and Fengshan, I've often been concerned with how residents, especially the vulnerable among us, can afford the daily necessities in life. Some will point to inflation statistics to tell us that prices grew slowly. But if we look more closely at the data, three items that saw higher growth than the headline figure over 2014 to 2019 were education, food and healthcare. Just last year, the Public Transport Council approved the biggest percentage jump in public transport fares since 1998. This came just as our public transport system is finally seeing its promise fulfilled after billions of subsidies funded by us, the tax-paying Singaporeans. Minister Corbyn Wan even hinted that commuters may need to pay even higher fares in future. How about the price of water, which did not change from 2000 to 2016? Within two years of telling Parliament that the price of water need not go up, the PAP went ahead and tell us that there is a pressing need to raise prices. Surely it was not to bring up the awareness of the importance of water. For the less fortunate among us Singaporeans who spend a larger proportion of their income on essentials, the effects of all these increases only weigh them down further. Those of us in the sandwich generation, caring for parents and children, face the burden of the rising cost of living. The PAP would have you known that they have a grip on cost of living. Back in 2018, Prime Minister Lee Hsien Loong promised us that the authorities we will do its part to alleviate people's cost of living concerns. But he also said, and I quote, each of us has a responsibility to look after our own wallets, save water, save electricity, and at the same time shop around for the best prices and be a smart consumer, unquote. This might sound like prudent advice, but how easy it is for Singaporeans to shop around. Costs are increasing consistently across the board. And in so many essential aspects of our everyday lives, on top of that, we already know that the goods and services tax is going to be increased from 7 to 9% after 2020. This will surely have an exponential effect on increasing the cost of living in the coming years. We in the Workers' Party know your pain and is committed to control the cost of living for Singaporeans. We said no to raising the GST without showing sufficient justification. We questioned the government on why it chose to raise water prices so dramatically after not doing so for so long. We are advocating for free public transport for seniors and persons with disabilities. We hope you can vote for the Workers' Party and tell the PAP that they cannot expect Singaporeans to be signing blank cheques to them. Make your vote count 
vote for the Workers' Party. Thank you. So we've just heard from Dennis, who has discussed with us about some of the issues relating to cost of living. And I think this is a very uh, pain point for a lot of families nowadays. Um, in fact, you know, I think the most of the complaints, you know, we hear from people either trying to start families or wanting to start families or even young families is children are really expensive. And, you know, normally when, when we hear, oh, are you going to have another one? Uh, the most common answer is, oh, I can't afford it. Um, and, you know, I think I remember the other day, Ron and I were just talking about the cost of baby formula, milk, milk powder. Yeah, exactly. Especially, this, yeah, yeah, especially when my daughter's like me, she's got a very good appetite. <laughs> She, drink, she goes through a tin of milk as fast as two weeks. And the cost of milk powder is ridiculous nowadays. Like, I remember when, when she was born, the tin, a tin of for, uh, milk formula is about 60 plus dollars. And after that, I asked my brother, hey, how's things over there in Australia? And he told me, oh, well, I can so, try and find it for you and maybe I can send it back to you. So I was wondering, oh, wouldn't that be too expensive to do the shipping and everything to come back? And actually, it's about half price in Australia for exactly the same thing as well. So... That's the situation now because I'm on family, uh, like young family forums on the internet as well. A lot of parents are complaining about the high cost of milk formulas for them. They're trying to, you know, ensure that their children are well fed, and especially for first time parents, it is very stressful for them to find the right formula, be it because their babies are picky eaters yeah. or because they have certain allergies. Yeah. They don't have a choice to, you know, go down the preferred option of breast milk as what the government is uh, trying to promote nowadays. So that's one very expensive cost, and then you add in your diaper costs, your medication costs, you know, your, your toys, your clothes, and all these things. It is getting very expensive for young families to, uh, to even think about starting families. Mm. And if I can add on to Ron's point over there, I think it's not just the direct cost of, of, of raising a child in Singapore. It is also the indirect cost of living and all these that adds up to the financial burden of families. So I, I find it a bit self-contradictory sometimes when I look at the um, PAP manifesto where it says that we will assist you with the cost of living, but at the same time, you are raising GST from 7% to 9%. Are we really um, having to raise GST or do we have to you know, perhaps think about alternative revenue sources that can be explored? I and mean, if you think about the burden that families face right now, um, just the other day, I, was, I saw an advertisement by one of the local banks which states that you need $1.3 million if you want to retire in 20 years. Sure, that depends on what assumptions are underlying that. But in another advertisement by the same bank, you see a, uh, another ad saying that two in three Singaporeans do not even have enough savings to last them for six months. Now, you can't, if, if you can't even last six months, how do you even consider retirement? And if you look back at the you know, financial burden of families, if the first thing that comes to our mind is you know, it's expensive to raise a child, then how do we even address the total fertility rate uh, issue where it's now at a record low of 1.14? And I think we need to rethink the underlying assumptions behind that and really consider what the longer term social economic cost would be rather than just think about the short term uh, issues of, of the cost of child raising. Okay, thank you, King Wee. Thank you, Ron. And now we're going to turn to the next video, which is by Faisal Manap. He'll be talking to us about the role of families and our approach. Thank you. Keluarga adalah nadi atau tunggak sesebuah negara. Sesebuah negara akan kukuh jika institusi keluarganya utuh. Usaha-usaha pembangunan sebuah keluarga yang utuh perlu dilakukan secara, secara holistik. Antara aspek utama adalah bagaimana seseorang ketua keluarga menjalankan tanggungjawab dan memainkan peranannya. Dan salah satu faktor yang mempengaruhi secara langsung aspek ini adalah keseimbangan kehidupan berkeluarga dan bekerja, work-life balance. Kajian telah menunjukkan bahawa keseimbangan kehidupan berkeluarga dan bekerja adalah penting dalam pembentukan keutuhan keluarga. Mencapai keseimbangan ini adalah sesuatu yang mencabar dalam kehidupan masyarakat Singapura. Di Singapura pada hari ini, masih ramai ketua-ketua keluarga yang mengeluh tentang kos sara kehidupan dan tidak mempunyai waktu berkeluarga yang berkualiti disebabkan situasi kehidupan yang mencabar dan menekan. Salah satu falsafah parti pekerja adalah membentuk sebuah kehidupan yang bermaruah di mana masyarakat atau rakyat Singapura dapat menjalani kehidupan dalam keadaan yang selesa dan seimbang. Parti pekerja amat 
menitik beratkan faktor keseimbangan kehidupan berkeluarga dan bekerja. Anggota-anggota Parlimen Parti Pekerja sering dan lebih dan telah banyak kali mengetengah dan menyuarakan pertanyaan dan cadangan yang berkaitan usaha untuk memperbaiki kehidupan berkeluarga terutama bagi keluarga-keluarga yang memerlukan. Saya sendiri telah menyuarakan beberapa cadangan seperti diadakan cuti bapa, semak semula kelayakan pendapatan bagi permohonan rumah sewa awam HDB, bantuan yang lebih baik kepada golongan ibu tunggal, semak semula skim COE bagi motosikal, diadakan sebuah sistem pemantauan untuk menilai keberkesanan skim-skim bantuan yang ada dan banyak lagi perkara yang lain. Usaha untuk memperbaiki keadaan ini adalah usaha berterusan. InsyaAllah, Parti Pekerja akan teruskan usaha kami ini selagi kami diberi amanah oleh masyarakat Singapura untuk menjadi suara anda di Parlimen pada pilihan raya umum kali ini. Undi anda memberi kesan kepada kehidupan dan masa depan keluarga anda. Manfaatkan undi anda, undilah Parti Pekerja. So Faizal has just spoken to us about uh, looking at families as a more holistic uh, in a more holistic way and also about some of the ways that we can achieve this. Uh, Sharif, I know you have some views to share on this and so maybe you'd like to just ask. Yeah. So Faizal Manap's uh, speech touched on work-life balance. Singaporeans, according to the Ministry of Manpower, uh, works about 44.7 hours a week on average in 2019. At commuting time to that, I think there's only a handful of hours left for the uh, parents to interact with children. The situation is even difficult if you consider dual-income household where both uh, spouses are working, and let alone single parent. Right? And um, for those from uh, lower-income household, uh, I, I used to work in low-wage work, and the way we make ends meet is by doing overtime work or taking on another job. So it is quite common for you know, a, a, spouse, a, a parent to be absent and usually it's the father. Now Faisal proposed a number of initiatives, one of which is uh, paternity leave. Uh, in addition to that, I would also like to uh, propose that the work from home arrangement which we saw during the COVID-19 period be extended to beyond the COVID-19 period. One of the complaints that uh, against uh, work from home is that uh, it affected productivity. My view is that it might be the case because there was only a uh, very limited grace period to implement a work from home arrangement. So if there is uh, sufficient preparation, I'm quite sure that it will turn out even better. It's not just businesses that should go digital. I think households can also go digital. And with this, you know, it, is, uh, it will support uh, parents who want to have more family time. It will support work-life balance. So on a more uh, micro level, uh, on a more personal note, I thought that we should also have a rethink of uh, gender roles within the household. Uh, you know, both uh, spouses can, uh, you know, like chip in when it comes to caregiving and housework. Uh, in, in my case, uh, you know, when I do uh, washing of dishes, I don't tell people that I'm helping my wife to wash dishes. I say that it is my job to do that. Yeah, that's how we do share household. Yeah, I mean, that's a really good yeah. point. You know, maybe I need to remember next time, you know, when I talk to my husband, right? It's not, please, can you help me with the dishes? Do your job. <laughs> <laughs> So, you know, it's so interesting that, um, you know, you talk about that, right? Because the mental load, I, I think we spoke about this in the women's show as well. Uh, the mental load is something that a lot of women have to deal with, especially when there's a bit more of an um, unequal distribution uh, of responsibilities and chores within the household. And, um, you know, for middle income to higher income um, individuals, um, you know, it does already take more of a psychological toll. So I can imagine how much worse it would be uh, for someone who, has, who is really struggling to make ends meet, right? 
Um, but I also like to go back to your point about um, you know the whole idea of working from home and even home-based learning during circuit breaker. I think these are terms that and these are arrangements that we we really took for granted. That you know if we had uh, the if we had the laptops and the devices at home and if we had all the time and if our company was flexible enough, you know then we had that leeway and we had the latitude to uh, really give our all to our kids even during this time. But for a lot of uh, families from uh, low-income households, uh, they don't they really really don't have that luxury at all. Uh, and you will find that it's really due to a couple of things, right? Number one, their work is not scalable, meaning that uh, if they don't work, they don't get paid. Uh, and the second thing is that uh, they, they probably have shift work as well, so they might be in essential services, and you know their working hours are very fixed. So it's difficult for them to tend to their kids. So I would also like to point to um, the fact that when an individual doesn't, doesn't earn as much in life, um, you know, the Singapore narrative is a bit troubling because we will always say that it's due to the individual not working or striving hard enough. But I think we also need to be mindful of the systemic inequality uh, that prevails and that is really quite present in society right now. Um, you know, I, I remember doing food distribution exercises in East Coast GRC, and we would do this on a monthly basis. And you would have all of these people, and you know, who who receive uh, food supplies from us. And sometimes when we try and offer them these food supplies, they would say, oh, no, no, you know, we want to be self-sufficient. Uh, you know, we, we are not going to take these handouts from you. And uh, you can give them to someone who needs them more. So I think that whole narrative about uh, people not, you know, lower in individuals who are lower income, uh, you know, freeloading or sponging off the system is really something that we really need to correct because that is absolutely not the case at all. Yeah, I mean, I find, you know, one of the things that you really, I, that they really came up very strongly when we were doing, you know, we were doing food distribution is the, the, the community spirit between households, how they look out for each other. Um, I don't really get that sense sometimes, you know, uh, in other parts of society. And I think, you know, we, we actually really need to learn from them. And this is something that will really benefit all of us as a whole um, if we actually adopt some of those, uh, you know, mindsets and mentality as well. And now we're going to move back to our next speech. Uh, this is by Nat, and he will be talking to us about some of the difficulties that young parents will face. My friends, I am at that age when the people around me are having children. It is both a joyous occasion and an impending sense of responsibility. I'm happy to say that my wife and I are expecting our first child very soon. We have talked over the caring of our newborn with the belief that caring for our newborn is a joint responsibility. That means that my wife will be taking her maternity leave while I will be taking my paternity leave. But do you know that in 2018, 65% of fathers did not take their paternity leave? Could it be society's expectations of women being the primary caregiver while men simply play a supporting role? There remains a stigma when fathers wish to play a more active role in raising children. Many families are lucky in getting support from their extended family. However, as a society, we are moving away from the extended family support structure. And this support may not be available to all families. To support our fathers, we can change our family leave policy to be gender neutral. That can begin by enhancing the existing shared parental leave scheme. This scheme combines maternity and paternity leave into a single shared parental leave entitlement and empowers parents to decide how to care for their newborn. Furthermore, the Workers' Party also proposes increasing the total parental leave entitlement from 18 weeks to 24 weeks, giving all parents an additional six weeks to care for their infant children. Throughout my grassroots work, I have observed that families are changing. There are more single-parent households, 
more families who would like to but are unable to have children and more marriages between Singaporeans and foreigners. Policies must keep up with the changing times. We propose to equalize childcare subsidies for all women regardless of status. We believe that fertility support can be enhanced for those who need it. For the sake of the children who deserve care from both parents, naturalization of foreign spouses on LTVP Plus should be fast-tracked. My fellow Singaporeans, we can live in a society where parents can feel free to care for their child. We can live in a society where policy changes to a changing time. Let us bring our proposals to Parliament. Make your vote count. Vote for the Workers' Party. So we've just heard a speech from Nat where he talks to us about the importance of having policies that actually support more gender-balanced families. Uh, Lewis, you know, as a young father of a nine-month-old boy yourself, I'm sure you know, all this is very pertinent to you. Mm. Uh, I'm just wondering whether you can share some of your thoughts on these. Mm, I would agree with that there, and I'm sure Ron would agree with me that you know, I'm very proud to say that I'm a diaper-changing dad. <laughs> so you know, over the last couple of months, I'm glad that I've been able to learn to feed him, change his diapers, and really just be a father to him. And I think it's time that we recognise that, th that there should be an equal sharing of responsibilities when it comes to bringing up a child, and fathers too have an important role to play in the ed education of their child. So it's one where, you know, I think this is a point mentioned by Nicole and, and Sharif earlier, that we really ought to think about whether or not there can be greater flexibility when it comes to work from home practices, when it comes to allowing families the additional flexibility to, to tend to their child. And I think it's something which, again, the narrative has been that, oh, if we give employees more childcare leave, more parental leave, it actually harms productivity, it's, it's bad for the company, it's bad for the economy. But I would say that it's, it's really the opposite, where you know, if you do provide the additional flexibility, the additional time off for parents to focus on their child when they need to, so that they can focus on their work, um, I think it's something which would even raise productivity. And this is something which I believe that a lot of companies here in Singapore have also recognised. And there are many progressive companies that have even 26 weeks of parental leave for both parents. Yeah, I mean, I'm quite pleased to hear we have some champion pooper scoopers uh, <laughs> <laughs> amongst us. <laughs> um, anyway, so, um, yeah, I think, you know, it's, it's obviously, you know, can we share with us um, you know, some, some of his uh, experiences as a father, and, you know, how, how he feels that he could be better supported for that. Um, but I think it's actually also very important for us to remember that uh, we, can't, we, we, we also must remember that, you know, not every couple who doesn't have children uh, actually has chosen to be that way. Of course, there are some who have chosen to, to, to not have children. But, um, you know, from, from, from conversations and from some of the data, it does actually show that there are many Singaporeans, Singaporean couples who are actually struggling and, um, you know, uh, to have children and they're they are struggling within the system to, to try and write support. Uh, I just wondering whether Nicole, you had anything to share about this? Yeah, uh, so actually, Ru is a matter that's uh, very personal to me and very close to my heart. Uh, also because I had quite a bit of difficulty conceiving and um, I managed to conceive my daughter via IVF. Uh, so I'd just like to share some of the challenges that I noticed during this entire journey. Uh, we will see that there have been statistics to show that uh, you know about one in ten of Singaporean couples will be uh, diagnosed as uh, having fertility issues. So it's actually more commonplace than we think. But I think at the end of the day, uh, you know, because uh, right after the point where you get married, everyone's asking you, "When are you going to have kids? When are you going to have kids?" And I think uh, for a lot of uh, as as a result of that, there's then a stigma on the couples where they just don't know how to seek help or they don't know if they're even like you know are doing things the right way. So I would say that it really boils on to a lack of uh, basic education on you know things like how to conceive and all but for those who actually have identified that uh, there is an issue then um, it's an entire ball game altogether and there are so many challenges involved in the mix right uh, one of them would be financial so um, obviously there is a huge financial cost that is involved in the entire process um, and also the lack of knowledge again so there are so many different procedures out there and they are all like you know for different kinds of like 
uh, ailments and uh, illnesses. But how do we identify and how do we um, put that public knowledge into the hands of people to make the best decision on what is the right choice for their body and what will result in the best outcome and the best um, if result. Uh. Um, the other thing is the amount of time that's invested in the entire process. Um, gynecology is a very personal kind of um, medical um, yeah, it, it's, a very, it's a very personal thing. So uh, you have to make sure that, you know, the gynecologist is someone who understands you and who also specialises in your type of issues, which uh, might not be um, a luxury that uh, people who go through the public hospital route uh, get to experience. So, um, and, and, the, and because of that, the amount of time, the amount of money that you spend just seeking out the right person uh, could really be a huge strain on resources. Um, lastly, because of the financial and the time implications, uh, you then need a very understanding employer. I think the last thing we want uh, is for employers to discriminate uh, on the basis of the fact that you're trying to have a kid. So we also need to have a more flexible and more understanding of workplace environment, and that really goes back to Lewis's point about, you know, what more can we do in that regard? Nah? Yeah. Thanks, Nicole. And now we're going to go back to the speech again. This time we've got Chen Chen, who'll be talking to us about our care systems. 大家好,我是陈真真。我是工人党板儿西选区的候选人。我在部落水池板儿区与位居民服务,接触了许多不同的家庭。这使我熟知大家的日常担忧。在新加坡,大家都说,能死不能病。这是因为医药费一直不断地往上涨还有一些昂贵的治疗和药物也应该不设限不过却是无常的劳动为无声者发声，请投工人党一票，让您的一票成就未来。谢谢。So we've just heard from Chen Chen, and she's talking about the various care systems. I think you know we've heard this word holistic a lot, but you know again, once again, I think we really need to look at the care systems as a whole rather than just separate healthcare, social care, infant care, because there's so many overlaps between these, and if we really start to compartmentalise all of them. I, 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 my fear is that really things will start to slip through the cracks and we don't actually maximise efficiency. I'm just wondering whether, uh, Sharif, this is something that you've, you know, you've studied before and I'm wondering whether you can share some of your thoughts on yeah. how we can tackle some of the issues. Yes. So I had the opportunity to conduct focus group with uh, economically inactive women. Actually, they are far from being inactive. Uh, many of them uh, actually... Uh, sandwich between uh, caregiving for old age dependents and caregiving for young uh, dependents. So when I asked them whether if they have a choice, will they work? And many of them said yes, they will work. And this has largely to do with costs and, you know, uh, I mean, you have two dependents to take care of, right? So 
uh, one of the things that are uh, preventing them from working is that although we have, uh, uh, you know, companies are uh, offered work-life grant to implement flexible work arrangement, most of the respondents were saying that they have difficulty finding employers who can really offer that kind of uh, flexible work arrangement. So what I, uh, you know, observed over time was that many of them take up jobs like food delivery work and uh, also home-based business. Now, these are, these are okay, you know. They, 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 such jobs give them flexibility and all that, but they, it doesn't put them on a career pathway. And there are the issue of, uh, there's the issue of uh, CPF contribution and also the question of whether there will be retirement advocacy in the longer run. What I feel is that there should be greater recognition of uh, you know, the contribution of informal uh, caregivers. Uh, and you know, like workers in formal employment, they should, uh, there should be a recognition that they too contribute to the nation. Yeah. Yeah, like speaking about you know, recognizing unpaid labor, a lot of families, a lot of family members are sacrificing the, their time to help look after the family. So I'm very grateful to, to my mother and my mother-in-law for helping look after my young kid. Because if not, how are we able to find childcare facilities for them? And as you know, and as you, um, a lot of young families know, they are facing challenges to find available slots in the you know, childcare facilities within their neighborhood to, to put their child there while they go to work. And on top of that, they have to get out of their own estate to travel further down so that they are able to find childcare facility for their child. And that's quite disheartening because they're trying to do the best for their own family as well. But unfortunately, we do not have such facilities or enough infrastructure to provide such facilities for families. And that's just looking after the young, what about the old as well? People are aging, Singaporeans are aging. We need to have these facilities in place to ensure that we have the best facilities and adequate facilities for all Singaporeans. Next, we have a speech by Terence Tan, and he will be talking to us about the education system. As parents, we all have hopes and ambitions for our children. I have two young children, aged three and two. They love going to preschool and learning through play. They get upset when the weekend swings around. Many of my fellow candidates have children too. Our common hope is that they go to schools that nurture their curiosity, their creativity, that instill in them a lifetime desire to always keep learning and growing. After all, the next generation will need to navigate an increasingly disruptive world. What better way to help them than to equip them to become the disruptors in a disruptive age and create jobs and a vibrant economy for themselves and others. But there's still so many horror stories on education that we hear during our outreaches to residents. At the primary and secondary school levels, we hear that the number of assessments and examinations are overwhelming. If our children do not do well in high stakes assessments, they are branded inferior and sent to a lesser stream. Does this serve to stretch our children's potentials or to depress them or even to stifle their potential love for learning? My fellow Singaporeans, one Singapore child ending up discouraged is one child too many. We have heard that various educational reforms are underway. That feedback has been taken by the Ministry of Education that the objectives of maximizing every Singaporean child's potential and to nurture them in a lifelong desire to learn were not being wholly met. The Workers' Party intends to see that these reforms are met. If elected, I will work with my colleagues to follow up on the MOE's reforms and play a part in ensuring that our younger Singaporeans will truly benefit from what the Ministry has already promised. The development of a lifelong joy of learning and more pathways for Singaporeans to succeed. Our education system must also remain accessible to all, particularly to those from disadvantaged backgrounds. I count myself lucky to have enjoyed the benefits of a good education and good schools in the 70s and the 80s. My fellow classmates came from all walks of life. Many in my cohort went on to achieve fulfillment in many fields as a direct benefit of being given a good education. But we cannot pretend that the playing field is level. 
that Workers' Party believes in active intervention to seek out ways to level the playing field, whether it be it through smaller class sizes or ensuring equitable funding to all schools. No young Singaporean must be deprived of a holistic education. The Workers' Party believes in supporting Singaporeans to achieve their full potential and seeing them blossom into world beaters. Should you agree, I ask that you vote for the Workers' Party. Make your vote count. So we've just heard from Terence about the education system and this is a topic that is very close to our hearts. For me personally, I actually believe that, um, you know, I think there's a very strong need for access schemes to be put in place to give greater accessibility for children from lower income and disadvantaged families uh, to get to universities and also even to the professions. Uh, I think a lot of things that many of us maybe take for granted is that uh, we, we know, we are familiar, or at least we, are aware, we know people who have gone through the similar application process and you know, who know what to do in order to get there. So I think, for example, in the, in the UK, um, a lot of universities, especially the top universities, they place a lot of emphasis and a lot of um, emphasis and a lot of uh, importance on these these access schemes. When they have very targeted program, they actually pair up, for example, current students with uh, identified mentees. So it's a mentorship kind of program. When they actually do bring these students from um, from 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 very disadvantaged backgrounds, but have very Good potential, and they, they're you know very bright, and uh, could could actually benefit from a bit of mentorship from current students to helping them understand what the applications process is, helping them understand you know even things like you know when going for an interview, how do you, you know, interview preparation, how do you dress? I mean something as basic as that that many of us take for granted. Um, you know I think this is something that we can do in Singapore, and not just for universities as I said, but also for professions as well. Because you know, job interviews are scary, especially when you're coming out of university. And I don't think um, many of us could have done it without the support and the preparation given by people around us. So I think um, one other thing that I would really like to say about this is, uh, you know, we really have to challenge the narrative that uh, widening access to education, to opportunities, will actually result in a more competitive or uh, more difficult, um, a more challenging, a competitive playing field for everybody. I think actually we are looking at a situation where these guys, you know, when we actually get more people, you actually increase the talent pool. And I think it's actually very important that, um, you know, we, we, we focus on this. Personally, I'm someone who makes, uh, who is in the position of making hiring decisions. Uh, so what you've rightfully pointed out is that we need to do more to protect our Singaporean workforce, uh, especially the ones who are entering the industry right now at such an uncertain time. Uh, one disturbing trend that I've noticed is that uh, I think it's, there is a sense of that there is a lack of uh, youth employability readiness where, you know, like what you shared, they might show up to an interview dressed in like denim cutoffs or they're not prepared or they don't even know, uh, you know, what the company does or what job they're applying for. I think we, you know, sometimes it's too easy for us to chalk that up to that being the fault of a generation to say that, you know, are they so spoiled and are they so sheltered that they did not even bother to prepare and they don't have the fire in their belly anymore compared to the older generation. But I think that's also a gross generalization, right? I think on our end, like we need to consider what kind of um, systemic um, measures can we put in place to improve that and make sure that our youth are ready. And also we see that, you know, it's not just so much about technical competence anymore. You, you could take a course. There are so many courses out there, right? There is skills future, you know, you can apply for so many of these things. And then they will give you a certificate that then allows you to, you know, get that foot in, put through the door if you're applying for a mid-career switch. But we also know that such causes are very theoretical in nature and they just scratch the surface. So if you really want to be able to adapt, you really want to be able to like, you know, assimilate into like uh, the global workforce especially, then we need to be able to develop our soft skills. We need to be able to be more resilient. We need to be more adaptable. So just to give you an example, um, when I'm in the marketing industry, we do see that the trends and the kind of technology that we use shifts on a six month to one year cycle. So if you don't learn fast enough, then you're just going to get left behind. Uh, lastly, I think in terms of tertiary institutions, and you've shared some about that already, uh, we do also need to make sure that we shift away from being very academia focused to seeing what more we can do to create that hands-on experience for uh, our younger Singaporeans. Yeah, uh, just to add on to that, right, uh, on the 
issue of focusing on academia. And I personally, personally, I feel that uh, class sizes should be reduced. Now, I understand that if you reduce class sizes, then there will be the issue of cost. You know, you need to recruit more teachers, you need to have the facilities, and maybe it might even result in schools having to restructure their, you know, their, uh, their, their environment. So, uh, one of the uh, ways to deal with this is to, uh, you know, uh, I mean, when you, when you have smaller class sizes, you may not need that many enrichment programs or remedial classes, you know, because the teacher will be in a position to provide uh, personalized attention and deal with the students' issues as, you know, the program is, uh, lessons are being conducted. Uh, and, you know, in uh, Workers' Party's manifesto, there's also the 10-year through train program, uh, which will help to shift the focus away from uh, exams to experience, experiential learning or, you know, knowledge-based learning, which, uh, you know, uh, will better contribute to the development of talents and skills. So actually at this point, yeah, I think we really need to think about the underlying assumption as to what exactly is our education system going to do, whether or not it can actually serve its purpose, whether or not it can equip our children with the right skills and knowledge to prepare themselves for the industry of the future. So to me, it doesn't matter whether or not um, we score the highest in the PISA scores in math and science, whether or not our primary school kids can actually memorize certain facts about photosynthesis. It's really about whether or not you know, our education system provides us with the right skill sets, the right, um, you know, provides us with the ability to think critically, and the, with the ability to learn, relearn, and unlearn some of this knowledge, because as Nicole mentioned, we live in a rapidly evolving world where technological disruption happens so quickly. So it is all the more important for us to impart not just knowledge, but really skills of the future to equip our children um, to be better able to ad adapt. Yeah, I think to add to that, with the ever changing society that we're facing now, we must not neglect the education of family values. Because a lot of families are focusing on grades, like you mentioned, get, you know, study hard, get the best grade, get the best job. But by doing that, you do neglect a bit of yourself in your position in, in the whole family nucleus. So like we've shared earlier, families are spending more time trying to earn enough income because of the high cost of living for their families. They don't spend enough time with their children. And this is just one part of it. They're not spending time with the elderly as well. We're slowly eroding our culture, our even more so towards our Singapore identity even. Like when I come back from overseas that time, I find that, hey, how come Singaporeans are like, you know, not as friendly perhaps as, as in the past? People are closing their doors at HDB estates. Well, in the past, I remember when I visited my relatives to leave the door open, everyone would be saying hi to each other. I feel that that's something that we need to look into. Respect your elders, respect your culture, pass it down. Traditions, once lost, is gone forever. And that's something we must not forget in this growing society of ours. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, I think, thanks, Ron. I think that's a very important uh, reminder for us all, uh, especially when we all get caught up in the rat race sometimes. So it's, it's really important to sometimes just take a step back and, you know, reassess and, and really think about what matters to us. Thank you, everyone, for your time. Um, you've come to the end of our show. Make your vote count. Vote for the Workers' Party. Thank you. Thank you.